Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the Trauma Corner podcast. I have to give a trigger warning here and I can't really say too many words because I think this video might get taken down. But my guest today is talking about her experience with CSA, which is child abuse. And I, I know you know what the middle word is, unfortunately. If you have gone through these experiences too, I hope you find comfort knowing that you are not alone. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am good. I'm warm, but I'm good. And I've just built some Lego and I don't know where to put it, but I'm good. This is, I've just recorded a trigger warning because this is something that not many people talk about. So mm-hmm. there's not a lot of this out there. So I would like to thank you for your bravery. And I think you should be really proud of yourself for talking about it. Because like I said, before we started recording, out of the clients I have, every third or fourth person talk about similar experiences. But they're talking it to me in confidence and they don't talk about it to anyone else. So there are people walking around who've experienced similar things, keeping it to themselves because they think it's just them. Right. It's very hard for me to listen to when clients talk about it because I don't get a trigger warning. It's like, hi, this is my name. So when I was a child and it's especially having a daughter, right? I got a son and a daughter and another son on the way. It's very hard to listen to. And it's often in the family and... If you could start by telling us your story, I know you, you share a lot online and at the end we'll talk about um, where people can find you to hear more about you. But if you can start wherever you're comfortable starting and tell us your story, please. Yeah, so um, my story started off as early as I can really remember. Um, some of my earliest memories are being um, abused by my biological mother and my um, stepfather. Um, I guess I should start with that um, my biological mother met my stepfather when I was about one years old. So um, my biological dad wasn't really in the picture. He has um, disabilities. So um, that kind of kept him absent. So I was I grew up mainly around my biological mother and my stepfather. And the first memory of me being um, abused was them um, participating in intercourse And then I was coerced um, into it because I was sleeping on their bedroom floor um, after a family movie night. Um, It was a pretty normal night um, and it ended up with me getting um, sexually abused. And then from that point, um, during that time, it involved like fondling and um, them coercing me into um, touching them and doing things. And at this time, I believe I was five but um, I suffer from fragmented memories and um, repressed as well as suppressed memories. So that's just like from pictures and things like that, I would say that I was around five. Um, It could have been earlier. But then from that day on, um, I was sexually abused by my stepfather, not my mom, just my stepfather um, for nine years. um, I would say every other day about sometimes more um, up until I was about 13 years old. And, um, as well as the sexual abuse, I, um, cause sexual abuse involves a lot of different things. So during that, I, um, there was a lot of no contact sexual abuse, like being shown, um, pornography and, um, him watching me do things to myself and things like that, as well as a lot of physical, um, molestation. And then as well as animal child sexual abuse, which is not often talked about. It's very taboo, but it is happening a lot more than we would like to um, face as a society. And for the people who don't know what that is, that is when a predator will force a child and an animal to do sexual things together. And that can be anything, um, penetration, fondling, it can involve a lot of different things. And um, so, and that happened to me when I was eight years old. And it only happened once that I can remember, but from that day on, um, I was extremely shameful and uh, traumatized. And I didn't talk about it until I was, I believe, 21 is the first time I disclosed that to somebody. And right now I'm 23. So, um, I mean, it happened when I was eight years old. I didn't talk about it until 21. So you can imagine that I carried that for a long time. And I believe a lot of other survivors are as well. It's, it's not something that we want to disclose. It's, it makes you feel really disgusting and um, shameful. So that went on until I was about um, 13, just the being abused by my stepfather almost every other day. 
And then after the sexual abuse ended with my stepfather at 13, my mom, um, this just was really normalized in our family and our lives. So my mom, um, we were in a bad place financially. So she um, offered to have me take explicit pictures of me as a 14 year old child by a man that she had known since she was young. Um, she was still over the age of 18 when she met him, but she was uh, younger and she um, took me to his house and he um, took explicit adult, you know, pornographic pictures of me for the child porn industry. And then um, I don't know whatever happened to those pictures. I don't know how many people have seen them, where they were put, you know, in the world. And then um, I just kind of have to sit with that now as a survivor and wonder how many people have seen these inappropriate pictures of my body as a child, which has really been hard to face. And I didn't even realize that it was a form of child sex trafficking until I got much older and realized that my body was literally exploited for money. Um, and then as well as those pictures being sold and whatever they were, you know, produced or whatever, my mother was also paid for having me go to that man's house by him. So her bills were paid and things were taken care of. We were taken on shopping sprees where I could buy school clothes, which my mom did not think she could um, do herself. So that's why I was, you know, she used my body to, you know, provide for our family or in whatever sense. And um, along with the child sexual abuse, I just lived in a very abusive home, like not only physical, but very psychologically abusive and emotionally abusive. My mom would lock our food up. We would, you know, have just very unusual punishments that you wouldn't really think of. Um, a normal, typical person wouldn't think of doing these things to their children. We got called slurs like the R word and just completely demeaned. I remember like asking my mom things like, or telling my mom, like, I want to be a veterinarian when I'm older or things like that. And she would just shot it, shoot it down with no, you're not going to make it anywhere. Don't even think about going to college. Like you guys are just the R word. Um, she would just say that we were nothing. So um, these types of things keep kids in um, abusive situations. We have low self-esteem and we don't feel loved or valued or anything like that. So it's hard to reach out to other adults for help when all the adults that you've seen in your life, in your life are scary and they, um, that's what you view adults as. So do you have any other questions that you would like me to touch on? Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's, it's, it's a lot. And when we go through these traumas, we talk about it like it's fucking nothing because it was so normal to us. Yeah, for sure. When, when we're children, we can't question what's right or wrong. So a lot of the time, like you said, you was 21 when you started speaking about it. For a long time when we go through traumas, we think everyone must be going through this because I'm a child and I deserve love. So this must be love. This must be affection or attention or whatever it is. Was there a certain point where you realized that it was normal or was that always a thing for you? I think because it started so early for me, I really did just think it was normal. Yeah. I would say that I started to kind of question it and think maybe this isn't normal when I started high school um, just because the people around me um, were talking about things and disclosing things in their lives that their parents did for them. And I could not relate to this. Um, I couldn't relate on going to family vacation or having a fun time with my family. I just, I couldn't relate. So then I started questioning like, huh, like what, what did, like, what is going on? And am I, and then I started to feel like, am I the only one? who is going through this instead of thinking like, Oh, this is normal. Everyone's going through it. Then it was a shift. And I was, I was thinking, man, maybe I'm actually completely alone. Yeah. And then, and then you don't want to talk about it because if you are alone, then it's even fucking worse for you to bring that out. Um, when, when we're children and our parents were put through abuse, well, oftentimes, even if this is just subconsciously, oftentimes we think if they can't love me, why the fuck would anyone else? And it really fucks you up as an adult. And you said about you're unable to ask for help from adults because of this. And again, we deserved unconditional love and support from our parents and didn't get it. So we obviously we're going to think, why would why would a random stranger give that to us? Why should we trust anyone else if, if our parents betrayed us like that? And 
your your mother and your stepfather and everyone else involved were monsters. You use the word predator. I would I would say monster. How el- how else does this affect you in adulthood? Um, I mean, it affects me every single day. Um, I struggle with flashbacks, um, and I don't think that people really understand the severity of flashbacks or struggling with PTSD um, or complex post-traumatic stress disorder um, when it comes to child sexual abuse, because it's not so much like um, you can pinpoint your um, triggers or what's going to cause a flashback. It's more just everything um, and anything because it was just your everyday life. So simple things like mirrors or um, the smell of bacon cooking or just very simple things can just kind of flip something in your brain and then you just start thinking about all of these things that happen to you. Um, And they're very vivid. So I would say that every day I struggle from flashbacks. I have major depressive disorder and severe anxiety. Um, I'll be going to therapy for um, the rest of my life. It, you know, it'll forever be with me. It affects my... um, the my sex drive and my ability to be intimate with my partner and just i mean it affects you permanently for sure of course it's you're very i know you know this i don't know you're told this all the time but you are a very strong woman and i am for if it's worth fucking anything i'm deeply sorry for what you've gone through and of course it's going to affect you every day it's especially especially when it comes to your partner the flashbacks i've had was so in 2020 just briefly I found my grandfather dead and then five months after my father died and then my wife was pregnant and when I went to visit my father and my grandfather when I went to visit their bodies when I left I kissed them on the head and they were cold and then when I had a baby whenever I would kiss her on the head and she wasn't she wasn't warm straight back but for you there are no triggers it, it can just happen so that I know there are a lot of people listening, like I said, how unfortunately, ho- fucking horribly, how, how common this is. There are people listening who are crying now and listening to your words, you know, when they weren't alone. The same feelings you were feeling when you got, I think you said high school, where you thought, oh, fuck, people are not talking about their parents in the way mine are treating me. And mm-hmm. that feeling, people are listening now and carrying that feeling. They don't want to talk about it because they feel like they're on their own. Um would you have any advice for people who have been through it and maybe have never spoken about it or don't know how to how to navigate their life now my advice um, would definitely be to give yourself grace for sure um don't rush your healing don't feel like i'm 40 or i'm 50 now or even maybe you're younger than that but a lot of the times people who feel that way are um, significantly older than me Um, maybe it's they feel like it's too late um understand that healing is a journey for everyone and that there's never um it's never too late to disclose it's never too late to just tell anyone the, the closest person to you and i do really strongly believe that telling somebody even just one person really does help not being able to not having to carry all of that weight um, by yourself is it makes a significant difference in the ability to heal. And then I would um, always say that let yourself guide your journey. Don't ever let anyone else or anyone else's story guide you. If you don't want to disclose, you don't ever want to tell anyone and that's truly how you feel. That's okay. Um, Just find ways to cope and find um, healthy ways to release those feelings without maybe having to talk about your story because sometimes people can't and that's perfectly okay um it's different for everyone and um don't have society or people in your life pressure you to do things that aren't going to help you heal Um, and that goes for disclosing socially just to family therapists as well as legally Um, we all have different journeys and that's completely okay Um, And then also give yourself grace in being angry and feeling all of those feelings. It's, it's okay to feel them and you have every right to feel them. Um, We were taken and and robbed of our childhood a lot of the time. And that takes away, go on, sorry. No, you're fine. I was just going to say, so it's fair to feel that way. Yeah. And when we have parents like we have, it's, they don't allow you to express your emotions. So I completely agree with everything you said, but especially 
give yourself grace, you are allowed to feel these emotions. I know you've um, you've had contact with your mother and a lot of my clients who've been through similar situations, trafficking also, they, they are still in contact with that parent <laughs> because they they say, it's still my mother. And what I find interesting is they tell me about how much of a monster their mother, usually the mother, the, how much of a monster their mother is for doing this and for using their children. Um, and then I say, what do you feel like you owe your mother? And they give answers. They're like, I feel like I owe them this, I owe them this. It's it's, it's like a Stockholm Syndrome thing. It's bizarre how much they still have this attachment. Um, but they, our parents treat us like extensions of them and not human beings. And a lot, a lot of people think that if they cut contact, then they will miss that parent. But what you miss here is what they could have been. You're missing the hypothetical mother that you deserved but never had. Um, a tricky question is how do we protect our children from this? And recently, um, so I've never let my, my children sleep out. We've, ne we've never needed to. Um, mm -hmm. I, there, there were people in the family that would have them. But my daughter especially, she's like a fucking tornado. She's really hard work, right? But... I've never, they've never slept, they've never stayed a night away, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I'll be doing seminars, I'll be flying in to do seminars in November, and I was speaking to a friend about this, and I said, I've never left the kids overnight, and they, they're going to be with my wife in my house, right? So it's, they're not going anywhere. And my friend said, you need to get used to it, because soon she'll have friends and she'll be sleeping over. And I I don't think I'm going to be able to let her sleep anywhere. Not not anywhere. Um. She doesn't need to. I would don't like don't think I'll be able to let her sleep over a friend's house where I I don't know the household and I don't know the I don't think I'm whether that's overprotective or good parenting. I won't be able to unless I'm hundred percent sure that situation's safe. Whereas when I was a child and I I put a video up about this recently, um, my mother wanted to have a, like a date over and she asked me to sleep out and I was like um okay so I was in a sleeping bag in a field with a friend. <laughs> Um, because we had no one else to go, like, and I, I wouldn't, I, I, I couldn't do that to my daughter. Do you think there is any advice for how we could protect our kids from this? So with the sleepover thing in particular, I would agree. I don't think it's smart to, um, yeah. allow sleepovers, um, just because you really can't guarantee a hundred percent that your child's safe. Um, no matter how close you are to that person or how much you think that you know them, um, unfortunately, a lot of the times child sexual abuse happens by somebody the child trusts, somebody the child knows, or um, even a family member. So it's it's really hard to say 100% I'm going to trust my kid to go to this place. Um, of course, there's things that you can put in place to make sure your child is maybe safer, like even cameras to an extent, you know, there's daycares that have cameras. So if you have access to indoor cameras or something, you know, you can but it doesn't even guarantee a hundred percent with cameras because there's always going to be places where your child could be taken alone. So definitely no on the sleepovers. And then I would suggest that, um, teaching, um, child sexual abuse, um, like the signs of it and how, like, not even necessarily the signs, but teaching it, um, in school and, um, adding it into the curriculum of like sex education or something to that extent, um, telling kids that they can reach out to these people in case there's something going on at home. Um, and then parents can do the same thing. Come to me if anyone at your school makes you feel uncomfortable. But the reason why it needs to be taught in school, and a lot of people are against this, but it does need to be taught in school because unfortunately, like I said, it is people that the children trust or um, family members. So if parents are abusing their kids, they're not going to say, here are the people that you can go to to get help. So these kids are left with no one. They don't know who to go to because they've never been told you can go and tell your teacher or you can go and tell the, the counselor at school. I was never told that. I talked to those people at school and I showed signs of emotional distress and there were signs that I was being sexually abused, but I couldn't directly tell them. I didn't know that that was an option. So definitely putting that in the curriculum and then educating, you know, your before you have kids, you need to be educated about child sexual abuse. I really do believe that. You need to know the signs and how to um, prevent it. One of the best things that we can do to prevent it is education. So just being as educated as you possibly can be. And then um, that goes along with sex education, which would be teaching proper 
bodily names for body parts, which would be vagina, penis, not private areas or um, no, no square. That's what I was taught. <laughs> really weird that I was taught no, no square while people were touching me. <laughs> so I just really find that one really interesting. Um, so yes, teaching those names, very important because not only for the child to, you know, like if you're told like your, your father, if your daughter came to you and said, somebody touched my private parts, you'll understand that you know, it's, you know, common sense. But if you go to a legal setting and you tell the judge that, um, that's when it starts to get iffy. They really do need to know vagina and penis to be able to report legally. Yeah. So that's a really big thing. And then um, just being an actively involved parent, just that's really big. Um, knowing who your kids are around, knowing um, the activities that they're involved in, who are, who's coaching them, who's teaching them. Um, not just taking people as at face value, doing screenings if possible, and um, just doing everything you can to prevent child sexual abuse. And if that seems as overprotective, your kids are going to grow up and understand one day why you did those things. And they're going to be happy that they didn't have to go through child sexual abuse. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we're even homeschooling. I, I didn't even think about when you're saying about the screening and the cameras in, in school and, and places like that. I saw a video recently of a guy that um, he was a predator and he was interviewed after he came out of jail and he would tell people how, he, how he'd done it. And he said he would look for families where the fathers weren't present, where the fathers weren't involved in the family because it was easier to, to if, if your parents are not giving you love and someone comes in and fakes that, for sure. Um, my stepfather was all about demeaning my biological dad. Um, he did that throughout my entire childhood, would tell me that my bio dad didn't actually love me and things like that, even though in the back of my head, I knew that wasn't true because my bio dad did love me and I knew that. But I still would have these questions and start to think, well, maybe my biological dad doesn't love me. And then I would kind of feed into more of wanting my stepfather's attention. And he definitely did that on purpose. I have two more quick questions here, if you don't mind. First one is, if you could fast forward in time to when you were 80 years old and you look back on this point of your life right now, what would you be proud of? I would mostly be proud of breaking the trauma bond. I really didn't know it was possible. Um, there were years where I thought, this is just what I deserved. Um, I deserve to just forget it, forgive them and just move on. And um, breaking the trauma bond was the best thing that I ever could have done in my life. Um, it's catapulted my healing process and just everything in my life um, to a point I never thought would be possible. I, I'm not going to say I'm proud of you because I don't want to sound patronizing, but I, you should be very fucking proud of yourself. Thank you. For people who want to maybe reach out to you or, fi or learn more about your story there, where can they find you online? So you can find me on TikTok um, at Jada's Advocacy, and it's um, Jada with a period and then advocacy. Um, and then you can also find me under the same name on Apple Podcast and Spotify Podcast. And I have released some episodes there, which I'm really excited to start um, putting more podcast episodes out. They're a lot more educational than my um, TikTok um, content. So I'm really excited to start posting more on my podcasts. Good for you. You are helping a lot of fucking people. Thank you so much for your time here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.